So what have I learned after two years in the field? That the switch needs to happen first in the way we understand and use energy. If we look at today, the foundational energies, the energies that built our modern economy are oil, transportation, and coal, electricity. What the plot shows is the higher the price goes, there's more oil. It's the reserve is dependent on price. There's another seven to eight trillion barrels of oil out there at the right price or oil equivalents. So let's look at the alternatives. What are our options to oil and coal, these foundational energies? If we go back to our graph now, we've looked at solar, wind, geothermal. They're putting solar panels as coverings to parking lots. It's hot and there are no trees, let's use it. For alternatives, scale is the big one. Getting enough volume to begin to make a substantive replacement. How about hydro? Norway is phenomenal. Turbines under the mountain, you don't even know they're there. The water accelerates down the hill, flows out into the top of a fjord, it's perfect. Beautiful, clean energy, and if we all had topography like Norway and renewable rainfall, we'd be finished. <laughs> so you're getting the picture here that nothing's perfect. No energy source is without some challenges. So what does this mean for our energy future? You can see oil. It was 50% just 30 years ago, and it's down to 34% today. Coal, 29% today. Natural gas, 23% and climbing. Nuclear, 5% and climbing. Hydro, 6% and declining. And the renewables, biomass, biofuels, geothermal, wind and solar combined, around 2% today and will rise substantially out into the future. But it still doesn't tell us about the transition. Where does that start to happen? If we combine our foundational fuels, oil and coal, those move up and slowly decline in the future. If you combine renewables with hydro, you see that they move up, but not enough to be primary sources. The intermittency challenge is too great, and until that's solved, there'll be great regional supplements. And finally, if we combine nuclear and natural gas, they sit in the middle today and are growing out into the future and approaching the foundational energies. But we still don't see that crossover point until we combine nuclear and natural gas with the renewables. And now we see, some 50 years out, the crossover between foundational energies and energies of the future. It's not gonna be easy. Natural gas will nearly have to double, and it can. Nuclear reactors will have to build nearly three times as many as exist today. And renewables go up five-fold. Can we be certain that we can meet this challenge, and how can we do that? Well, the easiest way, the best way, is the energy that we don't use. That will reduce these multiples. Natural gas, nuclear, renewables will go down, it would mean 200 fewer nuclear reactors. It would mean 100,000 less wind turbines. We could meet that 50-year crossover with less infrastructure required. As I've traveled the world, I've come to realize that in fact, there's a tremendous role that each of us plays in efficiency, in changing our energy behavior. What you do and what I do are the most important part of our energy future. You remember how I added up my energy use? Well, I decided to subtract from it. We're gonna spray the radiant barrier on your decking. Oh, okay. Because that's where all the heat's coming in, right. the dark shingles. Exactly. The world uses, you know, 40% of its energy in buildings. You can insulate your house. That's got a short payback time and uh, reaps great energy benefits. Uh, put in a better hot water heater, for example. Check the windows, the leaks in the doors, and, and so on. These are relatively simple and largely cost-effective things that the individual consumer can And no do. matter? And they do make a difference at the individual level. Of course, if everybody does them, they will have an impact at scale. Hey, how you doing? A finished product. Looks a little different from what we had before, that's for sure. How's it going out here? Great. Pretty close. 
few more hinges, we'll be ready to go. Got a lot of lights. There we go. You can see that little curly Q one inside. You ready? Ah, here they come. We got on board at the bureau too, with our own solar parking canopy. Now, these things may not be for everyone, but they don't have to be. The important thing is to change the way we think about energy so we can change the way we use it. Just by doing a whole lot of simple things, um, mostly paying attention, turning things off when we right. didn't really use them, I was able to reduce the electricity use at our house by almost 40%. Each of us could live just as comfortable lives, but, uh, but use less energy. It directly correlates. It's a really simple relationship. Yeah. Use less, emit less. Yeah. These are steps that save money, they save energy, they save emissions, they're good for the climate, they're good for security, they're good for your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. That's the place to start. So any way you slice it, energy efficiency is good, and that's what we recommend any government focus on first, and letting, letting a democratic society make its choices based on the information available to it. And I'm confident that the citizens in, in our countries and the citizens in countries like China and India will make the right choices if they have the right information. Mm -hmm. Energy powers our lives. We are the end users, and that gives us a remarkable amount of control. We just need to do something about it in a way that makes sense for each of us. So when I found out our neighborhood allowed golf carts, we got one for errands and taking the kids to school. And it's powered by a battery. It's certainly not a Tesla, but it's a good start.